Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil took him up and showed him all the kings of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Can we please be seated. And let's pray again. Lord Jesus, as we approach this passage of Holy Scripture, we praise you, for in it we see your victory against the adversary of our souls and your adversary, the devil. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you proved yourself to be the Son of God. You proved your faithfulness and you proved the faithfulness of your Heavenly Father in overcoming these temptations. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you have won the victory for us. And Lord, you have given us the resources that we need in order to achieve the victory that you have won for us especially through your death on the cross and your resurrection. Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture, Lord, we pray that you would help us to see the, the wiles of our adversary. Help us to see the tactics that he uses to try to destroy. But Lord, far more than that, we pray that you would help us to see you, to see who you truly are, and help us, Lord, to, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, help us to achieve victory in the strength that you provide using the means that you have given us through your spirit and the word. For we pray this in your most holy and powerful name. Amen. It has been said that the cleverest ruse of the devil is to persuade you that he does not exist. And while that is certainly true for most in our culture, few here in this church would doubt the devil's existence. However, many of us, even in this room, who would affirm his existence, ignore his activity. And if that is you, you do so at your own peril. This threat is dangerous enough that Jesus included a prayer for protection from the devil in his pattern prayer, where he taught us to pray that we'd be protected from evil or from the evil one, that we would be delivered from evil. Puritan Thomas Brooks understood this in his book, Precious Remedies, Remedies Against Satan's Devices, when he wrote, Christ, the scripture, your own hearts, and the Satan's devices are the four prime things that should be first and most studied and searched. I think it's fair to say that those four are ranked in order. Knowing Christ and knowing the scriptures are by far the most important. You need to know your allies, but you also need to know your enemies as well. Failing to know your heart and failing to recognize the devil's wiles will lead to periodic and even regular defeat. 
So that's the danger on one side, but, but there's another segment of Christian culture that falls into the other ditch. They're keenly focused on the devil, but so much that they see a demon under every bush. There, there's this, a sensationalistic interest. Their understanding of the devil and his works looks more like a horror movie or a Frank Peretti novel than it does anything you would find in the Word of God. They believe that the fight is engaged with crucifixes or in incantations or the unseen angels and demons battling in the streets. Well, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ knew personally the existence of the devil and he faced him head on. Three times in our passage this morning, we see the devil tempting Jesus. And three times we see Jesus resisting temptation and gaining victory. Jesus knew the devil's tactics. And Jesus knew how to defeat him. This passage teaches us a great deal about the devil's tactics and how he's defeated. But far more than that, it teaches us about who Jesus is and what he came to do. At the baptism of Jesus, we heard the Father's testimony that he is the Son of God. We said, Behold, you are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Luke 3, 22. And in the genealogy of Jesus, we, in, in Luke 3, 38, we saw that Jesus is the Son of God. In this passage, once again, we see that Jesus is the Son of God. But ironically, it is the devil's temptations that provide the opportunity for this truth to be told. So again, we see three temptations in this passage. In verses 1 to 4, the first temptation to doubt God's provision. In verses 5 to 8, the second temptation to doubt God's plan. And verses 9 to 13, the third temptation to doubt God's protection. Now these temptations are unique to Jesus. They're personally designed by the enemy for Jesus to challenge God's declaration about the Son, again from Luke 3, 22. Now there is a version of each one of these temptations that we also will face. The enemy is going to use these temptations against you as well. Of course, they're not going to look exactly like this, but they are of the same species as these temptations. Satan has temptations for every situation and season of life. He knows when and where you're weak. So you need to know your weaknesses and the devil's strengths. You need to know your heart and the devil's tactics. But much more than that, you need to know Jesus personally. And you need to know the scriptures thoroughly so that you also can overcome. So in verses 1 to 4, we see the first temptation to doubt God's provision. I'm going to spend most of my time on this temptation because it teaches us principles that apply to all three. Matthew 4 gives us the, the same situation and a very similar description of this temptation. Mark in, in, in Mar, uh, Matthew chapter 4, Mark covers it very briefly in Mark 1 verses 12 and 13. Jesus begins this passage by telling us that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Luke uses this term to speak of, of someone who is spiritual, someone who is walking in holiness. He uses it of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Um, he, he uses it later on in Acts of, of Barnabas. So these, these are, are, are godly men and women. They're said to be full of the Spirit. But Jesus, we are told, in the prophecy given to Mary by the angel Gabriel, is that Jesus will be full of the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So Luke emphasizes the, the role of the Spirit again by emphasizing him that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, when we think about, about Jesus being led by the Spirit in the wilderness, not only does this tie the passage back to the baptism of Jesus when the Spirit descended on him like a dove, but it highlights the fact that God is at work here, that God is in control, that he has ultimate authority over these events. 
So this, and this is hard for us to wrap our, our minds around, but, but the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Nevertheless, we cannot conclude from this that God is responsible for the temptation. James 1.13 says clearly, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt, be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God will not tempt anyone, not even Jesus Christ. This is the realm of the devil. So Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, but to succeed where others before him had failed. Jesus is not only the Son of God, but Jesus is also the Son of Adam. We saw that, or if you remember, from Luke chapter 3, verses 38. Remember that this is one of the reasons why Luke, in his genealogy, presented it really in reverse. In every other genealogy in Scripture, it, it starts... It's, it, it moves forwards, but Luke goes backwards, starting with Jesus and working all the way back to, to Jesus, son of Adam, son of God, all the way back to the beginning. Adam was tempted by the devil in the garden and failed. Jesus was sent into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, to have victory. The first Adam's sin resulted in the death of the entire human race, but Jesus was sent to be the last Adam, the one who would bring life. We're told in verse 2 that Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Now again, as I mentioned to the children, Jesus was, was tempted for the entire time, for the entire 40, 40 days. This is a, a present tense participle. He's being tempted for that whole period. The, the three temptations that we see this morning are really the, the culmination of Jesus' uh, uh, being attacked by the devil in the wilderness. The devil is here rolling out the heavy artillery. That This is far worse than anything that Adam had ever faced. And the 40 days of, of temptation calls to mind another temptation. Israel's 40 years in the wilderness, Deuteronomy 9, 29, 5. Like their forefather Adam, Israel would succumb to the temptation and their bodies littered the wilderness. But Jesus came to succeed where they had failed. Now Jesus ate nothing during that entire 40-day period. You can imagine after 40 days without food, he was hungry. Jesus was, was truly God, but he's also truly man. He felt the same things that we feel. Hunger, thirst, exhaustion. But he also felt something else that we feel. Temptation. Being truly man, Jesus was capable of being tempted. He was like Adam before the fall. He did not have a sin nature, Yet he had the ability to sin. Like the Chalcedonian Creed states that Jesus Christ was of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead, and at the same time, one substance with us as regards his manhood, like us in all respects apart from sin. In two natures, the property of each nature is preserved in one person with one subsistence. Now, of course, we're, we're talking about something mysterious here, something that is beyond our ability to, to fully comprehend, but this is clear. Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man, and there is no mixture between his godness and his manness. His deity didn't spill over into his humanity to make him incapable of sinning. In his humanity, Jesus faced real temptation. Jesus had to be tempted with sin, actually tempted in order to overcome temptation for us. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect as we, as, as been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15, we looked at that in our men's and women's Bible studies this week. And the devil knew this. 
So he came at Jesus with everything that he had. Verse three, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. The, the devil knew exactly when and where to attack. The devil had been watching carefully. He, he knew the exact moment where to launch his attack and he knew exactly where to aim at Jesus' hunger. And at first glance, this appears to be a challenge to Jesus as the Son of God. It says, if you are the Son of God. But the temptation here is actually much more subtle than that. The, the grammar in the original language shows that, that, that it's essentially, that where it says, if you are the Son of God, and let's assume for the sake of argument that you are, command this stone to become bread. In other words, since you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. The devil is saying, prove it. Prove it. But it's not prove that you're the Son. It's prove that the Father cares for you. Prove that the Father cares for you. It's not really the sonship of Jesus that's being challenged here, but the fatherhood of God. The devil, which means slanderer, is trying to get Jesus to doubt the Father's love and care for him. Now, does that sound familiar to you? It should. Turn back your Bible, please, to Genesis chapter 3. Look at, the tempt, look at the temptation. We have the serpent here before Eve. Remember, they were allowed to eat of any fruit, any tree, of the fruit of any tree in the garden, except for that one tree. They were not allowed to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So again, we have a temptation surrounding food. There's a parallel here. It's also the same type of temptation in that the devil, here, look what he's saying, is that down in um, down in verse 5 for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil so the nature of the temptation as it was in the garden as it is here in the wilderness is that, is that God is holding out on you that God does not want you to have this, this there was this good fruit and here it's bread and there it was, he does not want you to be like him. And here is, is that he will not care for you. Frederick Godet explains that the, the devil wishes to make Jesus feel more painfully the contrast between his actual destitution, consequent on his human condition, and the abundance to which his divine nature seems to give him a right. In other words, he wants Jesus to feel like he has a right to eat, but that God is not providing for him. The devil is slandering God's character. He's trying to say that God was a liar when he said in Luke 3.22 that you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. So once again, as he had done in the garden, the devil is questioning what God said. Genesis 3.1, did God actually say? Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? But this time, did God actually say that you are my beloved son? So this temptation then to turn stone into bread is a temptation for Jesus to take matters into his own hands, to care for himself. The devil is saying that, that God has led you out here into the wilderness for 40 days. Now look at you. Look where it's gotten you. You're hungry. You better look out for yourself. It's a temptation to break the first commandment, and it's also a temptation to break the tenth commandment. It's a temptation to, for Jesus to put himself before God, and it's a temptation to want something that he doesn't have. But Jesus doesn't fall for it. He counters the temptation with the word of God. Verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now here he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 3. Matthew provides the rest of the sentence. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. Please turn with me in your Bible back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the people are, are about to enter Canaan. 
And Moses is reminding them that the Lord has cared for them and has tested them during the 40 years in the wilderness by feeding them manna. Look at the beginning of verse 3. By feeding them manna to show them that man does not live by bread alone, but, by every, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, unlike Israel, Jesus trusted that God would care for him. He knew that he was God's son, and he knew that God would provide for him. He knew that God had led him into the wilderness, and that God would provide food for him when he needed it. Notice also that the, the quote from Deuteronomy includes God's promise to provide. If Jesus had provided for himself here with, with food, he would have been acting without faith. In his humanity, Jesus learned to trust God. He's going to teach this lesson to others. John 4, 34, I'll teach the disciples where he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Luke 12, Jesus teaches others to trust God's providence for life is more than food. Luke 12, 23, and that people must first seek his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Luke 12, 31. So you, take, you worry about serving God and seeking to advance his kingdom and God will take care of the rest. That's what enables our brothers and sisters in Wuhan to be able to, to forsake their, their well-being in order to be able to, to serve God and serve others by proclaiming the gospel even in the face of the threat of getting coronavirus. Are you seeking first God and his kingdom? Are you trusting that he will give you everything that he, that everything that you need according to his perfect love and according to his perfect plan? Friends, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised by the devil's temptations. Rather, expect his temptations to come, especially when and where you are weak. You need to know your weaknesses so that you can prepare. Now with Jesus, the temptation came from the outside. He had no sin nature. But with us, we have the added danger of our sinful flesh that, that is, is it really in, in alliance, in allegiance with the devil's schemes. As in John Bunyan's holy war, the devil has friends on the inside. There are many diabolians entrenched within the, the walls of the town of Mansoul. Peter warns in 1 Peter 5, 8-9, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by, your, by the, your brotherhood around the world. And you resist the devil in the same way that Jesus did. Through the word. Through the word. Are you tempted to doubt God's love for you? Are you tempted to try to look after yourself? Are, are you tempted to take matters into your own hands? Maybe it's food. Maybe it's something else. Health. A relationship. Or, or even something as good as wanting the sanctification or even salvation of a loved one. Now, now there's nothing wrong with these things. There's nothing wrong with, with even working to provide for yourself. But the question is, are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in yourself or are you trusting God? If you are trying to make it happen or if you're trying to make anything happen by yourself and your own strength, that you are falling into the same temptation. Again, know when and where you are weak. Memorize scripture to counter the temptation. And even if it means sacrificing a need as basic as food, Never sacrifice obedience to the word of God. Never doubt God's providential care. So that's the, the first temptation, to, to, doubt, to doubt that God is going to provide. Well, the, the second temptation we see in verses 5 to 8 is to doubt God's plan. Now the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and he offers him 
these kingdoms in all of their authority and glory. Now Matthew, in Matthew 4, reverses the order, making this the third temptation. But the, the devil is here offering all earthly power to Jesus. The devil adds to the temptation and builds on it with a lie in verse 6. For it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. So Satan is here claiming this authority as his own. But in reality, this is, this is a half-truth, which is really one of the most deceptive kinds of lies. Satan is, in fact, the ruler of this world, John 12, 31, and he does rule over most, if not all, earthly kingdoms for now. But all authority belongs ultimately to God. Romans 13, 1 says, For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Daniel 4.17, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he wills and sets over it the lowliest, the lowliest of men. We could take comfort under, under any political empire, even if, if we had Nero as, as an emperor. We could trust that, that God is sovereign over these authorities, that he raises up one king and he takes down another according to his wise and sovereign will. Satan is the father of lies, John 8, 44, and he's trying to deceive Jesus. But Jesus is going to show that he, in fact, has the authority over the devil throughout his ministry. As Jesus casts out demons, as, as Jesus frees Satan's captives, breaking the chains of sin. Now, Jesus already had the authority. It was his to begin with. But the road to assuming that power would lead through the cross. And it's in that moment of apparent defeat that Jesus will gain the ultimate victory. But that path would be agonizing. The worst trial that any person has ever or will ever experience. And so the devil is saying, you can avoid all of that. But there's a catch. With the devil, there's always a catch. Verse 7. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. In order to gain this power, the son would have to rebel against the father. He would have to bend the knee to Satan. It's like the temptation that Galadriel faces in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings to wield the ring of power against Sauron. But in so doing, she would become a pawn of Sauron. However, we see Tolkien's works-based Roman Catholicism coming out when he says that it's because of, of this, because she overcame temptation, that she was pardoned for her earlier pride because of her resistance to the final and overwhelming temptation to take the ring for her herself. It's works-based salvation. You cannot press the allegory very far. For Jesus, it would be unthinkable to take power by worshiping the devil. It would have meant breaking the first commandment and the second. This temptation is about taking power for himself apart from God's plan and apart from God's promise. It's a temptation for Jesus to doubt God's plan for him. It's a temptation to, to bypass the, the path that God had set for him in favor of an easier path. It's a temptation to take the carnal route instead of the spiritual one. For Jesus, it would have meant rejecting his calling as the Messiah, as the suffering servant. And so even without hearing the catch, Jesus would have rejected the temptation because he knew the path that had been laid out for him. Jesus knew the definite plan and foreknowledge of God meant that he would be delivered into the hands of lawless men to be crucified and killed, Acts 2, 23. Jesus knew that his path led to the cross. But Jesus knew that his path didn't lead just to the cross, it led past the cross. In his deity, God the Son had made a covenant with the Father, a covenant to redeem his chosen people, the covenant of redemption. And choosing an easier path would mean never arriving at the destination. In a moment of greater temptation, much closer along the path to the cross, Jesus would say, Father, if you are willing, 
Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22, 42. So it's a temptation to doubt God's plan, but it's also a temptation to doubt God's promise. A promise that he will reign. And this promise is also tied to his sonship. Psalm 2, 7 and 8. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations for your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Only God can truly give this kind of authority. Luke 10, 22, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Jesus will be the one to give authority to others as he does to his disciples in Luke 22, 29. I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom. And the kingdom of Jesus is very, very different from anything that Satan could have offered. As Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. And so Satan is here attempting to break Jesus' relationship with the Father. This is another assault on the sonship of Christ. And once again, Jesus overcame the temptation. And once again, he does so with the word. Again, quoting Deuteronomy, this time Deuteronomy 6.13. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. God alone is worthy of worship. As Jesus declared in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Nothing could make Jesus rebel against the Father. The Son's loyalty will be rewarded with true power according to God's plan and promise. Jesus shall reign, as in the Isaac Watts hymn, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. Now we await the consummation of his kingdom. So we pray as Jesus taught us to in the pattern prayer, your kingdom come. Matthew Henry warns that, that all of Satan's promises are deceitful. And if he is permitted to have any influence in disposing of the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, he uses them as baits to ensnare men to destruction. Many a man and woman has been destroyed in the quest and thirst for power. We can get tempted as well to take an easier road, especially when things get hard. You can get ahead in business through flattery and manipulation. You can get your kids to obey you by yelling at them or bribing them. You can build a church using pragmatism and worldly methods. But don't follow the fleshly path. Don't fall to the devil's temptation. Rather, trust God's plan. Trust God's promise. Meditate upon his promises. Memorize them and preach them to yourself when you are tempted. Now we see the third temptation, verses 9 to 13, to doubt God's protection. Well, now the devil takes Jesus and sets him on the pinnacle of the temple and says to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now we can't know for certain where this, for certain where this was, but it was likely the top of, of Solomon's portico. The, the apex of the royal arch overlooked the Kidron Valley. It would have been a 450-foot drop. Certain death. But again, he assaults the relationship between the Father and the Son. Again, he says, if you are the Son of God. Remember, since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. If you are the Son of God, prove it. Prove God's love and care for you. That This is a temptation to doubt God's perfection. That... that if he is indeed the son and is faithful, God will protect him no matter what he does. So notice here that the devil is trying a new tactic. Remember how cunning your adversary is. If one tactic doesn't work, he's going to try another. He's not going to give up. Well, this time he quotes scripture in a wicked attempt to make Jesus fall in both senses of the word. He wants to destroy Jesus, body and spirit. And so we quote scripture, Psalm 91. Please turn with me there to Psalm 91. 
This is a messianic psalm. This is indeed a promise that God will protect the Messiah. And he quotes verses 10 to 12. Out of order, he says, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Again, he's saying that, that God has promised to protect you. Now jump. Augustine warned that the devil's, the devil's part is to suggest it is ours not to consent. No one can make you sin. No one can say the devil made me do it. And Satan here actually quotes scripture not once but twice, even using the same phrase that Jesus had now used. It is written. It is written. So having been thwarted by Scripture, Satan now tries to use Scripture to co-opt it to his own advantage. As Shakespeare wrote in The Merchant of Venice, the devil can cite Scripture for his purpose, an evil soul producing holy witness. It's like a villain with a smiling cheek, a deadly apple rotten at the heart. And it is an attempt to use the Word of God against the word of God. But friends, if scripture is taken out of context, it is no longer the word of God. Merely using the words of the Bible is not the word of God. Sinclair Ferguson says that the Bible is not a book of Christian magic in which some isolated verses leap out of a page on a random basis in some mysterious way happens to be appropriate for our condition each day. That the scriptures are not a horoscope. It is spoken at a particular time to a particular people and must be applied in its proper context in order to really be the Word of God. We need to understand the enduring truth of the passage we're looking at in order to understand and see how it applies to us. So yes, Psalm 91 is a messianic psalm. It is promising God's protection for the Messiah. This psalm does apply to Jesus. Satan does know the Word of God. However, he is intentionally taking it out of context. This psalm cannot be used to force God to protect the Son. Nor does it mean that, that the Son could, could foolishly put his life in jeopardy. So this is a temptation against God's care and against Jesus' trust. To succumb to this would be an act of presumption, making demands of God. Some succumbing to temptation here would have meant Jesus was doubting God's ability to protect him. Again, saying, prove it. Again, it's not really prove that you are the son, but prove that God is faithful. It would be like unbelief pretending to be faith. This is an extremely subtle temptation. It looks like faith, but it's actually doubt. Doubt. And once again, it's not really the sonship of Jesus that is being challenged here, but the fatherhood of God. The question is, will he be faithful? Well, yet again, Jesus responds with the word, in context, applied correctly. But notice that he doesn't say, it is written, but it is said. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, he's quoting Deuteronomy, this time Deuteronomy 6.16. It's a reminder for Israel not to test the Lord as they had done in Massa. Many of us read this this past week in the, our Bible plan from Exodus 17 verses 1 to 7. The people had, had not been satisfied with, with freedom. They had not been satisfied with manna. They, they, had, they didn't, couldn't find any water and so they, they grumbled. And God commanded Moses to strike the rock so that the, so that the, the water would come out. But unlike Israel... Jesus knows that God can be trusted. Jesus knows who God is. Again, God had proclaimed that Jesus is his beloved son with whom he is well pleased. And so Jesus is going to rest on God. He's going to rest on God's promises. Are you presuming on God? Are you like the man who is standing on his rooftop in the middle of a flood? And when the canoe comes by and says, come on, I'll, I'll help you, I'll rescue you. He says, no, no, God will save me. You probably heard this joke. And then, and then a speedboat comes along. He says, come on, the water's rising. 
It's up to the, the, the edges of your, of your roof now. Come on, I will, I'll, I'll rescue you. He says, no, no, God will save me. And then as the water is rising and the man is about to go under, a helicopter comes. He says, come on, I'll rescue you. And the man says, no, no, God will save me. But the man dies. And then he, he, when he's, he's standing before God, he says, God, why didn't you save me? But God says, I sent a canoe. I sent a speedboat. I sent a helicopter. Why did you presume against me? Or the prosperity gospel that also is a presumption against God. Now, I trust that none of us here would, would fall into that, that heresy, but, but the, the idea is that, that if you make a seed offering, if, if you do what you're supposed to do, making this seed offering, that God is now forced to bless you. That this is, this is a making, de making demands on God, but, but it's disguising it as faith. You, you would have heard just a, a few weeks ago about the toddler from, from one of the leaders at, at Bethel Church who had, had tragically died. And, and they were demanding that God would raise this child from the dead. According to, to a, a false claim on, 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 on what they believe to be God's promises. Well, God had never made that promise. God had never made that promise. And those poor people, but also many, many more, were duped into giving money to that false ministry. Now, of course, we would all reject that as heresy and as, as, as lunacy. But again, do you presume on God? Do you conclude that if you do certain things for God, that God is now beholden to do something for you. Or perhaps even more insidiously and, and more common, do you presume on God by acting as though you don't need to do anything? Remember, the scriptures teach God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Do you act as though, as though well, I'm, I'm saved. I don't, I don't need to pray. I don't need to pray for protection from the enemy. I don't need to read God's word. I don't need to study the word and, and, and become familiar with the word to be able to use it and to understand it properly. I think of myself as a, as a, a young child. One of the first times I was, was home alone and, and there was a, a horror movie on, on TV and, and I remember flicking back, I put, pushing buttons. It wasn't really a remote. It had a wire but back in the day. But, but pushing buttons, I'd flick back to the, to the TV and I was kind of, I'd kind of like watch it through... The, the, I wasn't allowed to watch horror movies, but I, I was home alone, and, and so I was like, yeah, I'm going to watch it, and watching like that. And then I would always flick back to channel just as somebody would, would get killed. And I remember one of the, the scariest parts for me was the, the killer was, was hiding under the bed. And I remember going up to my, my bedroom and, and being, being terrified and, leave, of course, leaving the lights on, and I don't think my feet hit the ground between the doorway and, and my bed. And I was, like, I, was, I was scared, so I thought, okay, well, in order to protect myself from, from the, the killer who could be under my bed, I'll put my Bible under my pillow. And that somehow, magically, this Bible will protect me from, from any attack. Well, well, no matter how many nights that Bible is under my pillow, its contents would not get under into my head. No matter how many days your Bible is sitting on your shelf, its contents will never get into your head or into your heart. Well, we see here in verse 13 that when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the end of the series of temptations, over 40 days of temptations, and Jesus had overcome them all. Jesus had been victorious. Now, Jesus will continue to face temptation from the devil throughout his ministry. We'll see this again and again and again in Luke, but that temptation will, will culminate in chapter 22 when he is tempted by the devil in the lead up to the cross. But Jesus is going to have victory again and again and again. He rises and overcomes every temptation. Christ defeated Satan, but there were many battles yet to be fought, especially on the cross. Brothers and sisters, the decisive victory for you has been won.
Final victory has been assured. This present battle is not about final victory, but about holding the ground that Christ has already won for you. When the Allied troops took the beach in Normandy on that June day in 1944, the decisive victory had been won, but the war was not yet over. There were many battles that still needed to be fought. Our victory has been won for us by Christ on the cross. I said earlier from Hebrews 2.14 that the devil holds the power of death, but it also says that through death, Jesus destroyed him who has the power of death. The Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3.8 Matthew Henry says that yet he departed till the season when he was able to, be, to let loose upon Jesus, not as a tempter to draw him into sin, and so to strike at his head, at which he now aimed and was wholly defeated in, but as a persecutor to bring Christ to suffer and to bruise his heel, which it was told him that he should have to do and he would do, though it all would be the breaking of his own head. Genesis 3.15, though Satan depart for a season, we should never be out of his reach till removed from this present world. Again, remember the genealogy from the end of chapter 3. And all of this showed that, that Jesus is indeed the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. But he himself would have his heel bruised in the process. Jesus was tempted, as we read in, in Hebrews 4, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He is the son of Adam. He is the seed of the woman who had victory over Satan. All three of these temptations challenge God's promise about Jesus' sonship from his baptism in Luke 3, 22. Again, the, would, would Jesus entrust himself to the Father's providence and his plan? Would he provide for himself? Would he try to take power for himself? Would he seek to protect himself? And Jesus was faithful in them all. He overcame all of these temptations. So faithfulness to God means trusting Him, means worshiping Him alone, means not testing His goodness. These are temptations that we also face on a regular basis. Jesus proved that He is indeed the faithful Son. Trusting in the faithfulness of the Father, He proved that He was ready to begin His ministry. And we'll see Him beginning His ministry next week in the second half of Luke chapter 4. The baptism showed that Jesus was the beloved son. The genealogy showed that he was the son of Adam, the son of God. And overcoming temptation shows that he is the son. And also by succumbing to Satan's temptations and by not succumbing to some Satan's temptations and overcoming them. He proved that God is faithful and he proved himself faithful. We have a great deal to learn here about the tactics of our enemy. But even more, we have a great deal to learn about how our Lord overcame for us. We see how He overcame, and we overcame, overcome because He overcame for us. And we overcome using the same weapon that He did, the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We don't engage in hand-to-talent combat. If a child is being picked on by a school bully and his father is standing right there, he doesn't, doesn't go to stand up to the bully himself. He, he goes to his father and asks for help. We also go to God to ask for help. We don't raise our fists to fight. We raise our hands in prayer. We resist the devil, yes, but we do so in the same way Jesus did, in God's strength, according to his word. As John Owen wrote in Overcoming Sin and Temptation, in truth, the Christian hope rests not ultimately in our own diligence, but in God's faithfulness. It is God, not us, who will ultimately persevere. And that is why He is able to promise us eternal life. Where the promise is, there is all the assistance, the faithfulness of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the power of the Spirit are all engaged in our preservation. Yes, the fight is strong. Yes, our enemy is powerful. But our victory is in Jesus. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we praise you for the marvelous victory that you achieved. Not over these temptations that we read about in Luke chapter 4, but throughout your entire life and ministry, culminating at the, the temptation you overcame at the cross. Lord Jesus, we praise you that your victory over temptation has been credited to our account for those who have repented of their sin and put their faith in you. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that you have won absolute victory, that your victory is ours, and that you will preserve us because you are faithful to your promises. We pray this all in your holy and precious name. Amen.